All right, guys, we're going to get started. I appreciate everybody's time and attendance here today. So my name is Chris Primus. I am the Vice President of OEM and National Accounts and Industry Relations for MaxLight. From my office here in Washington, D.C., I'm glad to be talking with you today. I work with manufacturers and my role with MaxLight. I work closely with the Energy Commission and with agencies that are over the Energy Star program. I'm going to provide you with some insight on the latest with these very important industry programs and answer some of the questions I've received as I work with various stakeholders in the market. I can tell you that these three programs I'm going to talk about have undergone some very major changes in the past year. They're going to greatly affect how lighting products are sold and used for a lot of you guys. I'm going to be talking a lot about requirements in the state of California, which is, of course, critical to, to those who do business in that state. But bear in mind that the regulations in California are already starting to be implemented by some national retailers and are being adopted by some other state and national programs. Those doing business in the residential and hospitality markets especially need to be aware of these latest updates. So today I'm going to go through some details of these program changes and discuss their impacts. We do have everybody muted as of right now. I will open the floor for questions at the end. I've structured the presentation such that I should answer most of your questions as we go along, but you can always ask me questions in the chat portal during the course of the presentation. All right, let's get started. So as far as my overview here is, we're going to talk about Energy Star, both the Luminaires and Lamps programs. There are two different programs as part of the Energy Star program. I'll go through those program changes and quickly about how they affect light sources and luminators. Uh, then I'll go into Title 24. I'll spend a lot of time on that because that's one of the biggest changes that happened recently. Overview of that program and the impacts there. And finally, with Title 20, the appliance efficiency regulations, there are some big changes happening really in 2018 I'm going to talk about. So before I move any further, let me just talk real quick about terminology I'm going to be using. So when I say the term lamps, I'm going to be using the industry definition of lamps. Sometimes these are referred to commonly as bulbs. Talk about luminaires, I'm talking about most of your hardwired luminaires, and sometimes those are called light fixtures. I'll be using the word portable luminaires when referring to table lamps or desk lamps, and those are products that typically have a cord and plug. All right, so starting off on the Energy Star updates, this is to the LAMPS program. The latest specification became effective this year, January 2nd. It was released December 31st, 2015. This change really reduced the lifetime requirement on most Omni lamps from 25,000 hours to 15,000 hours. But also, at the same time, the omnidirectional lamp efficacy was increased to 80 lumens per watt. And that's, of course, if your CRI is less than 90, which most of these are. If it's CRI greater than 90, you can get 70 lumens per watt. What this really means is with that efficacy increase up to 80 lumens per watt is that the vast majority of products that were in the program as far as lamps for CFLs, they'll no longer be able to be Energy Star certified starting in 2017. So really, you talk about the impacts of that change is on the CFLs. This program was primarily started to advance the adoption of fluorescent technology, and now it's a big change because everything is shifting over to LEDs with that efficacy increase. Uh, LEDs are already starting to become more popular for various reasons, and the price is getting lower. And so I'm going to see more LEDs be a part of the Energy Star Lamps program. The CFLs, if they were previously certified, they, they can sell through. You can sell through your stock but they're no longer able to be manufactured after January 2 of this year unless they meet the current specs. So you'll, you will see some products still out there carrying the mark, but all of those were manufactured prior to January 2nd. Anything manufactured after that date, just so you know, those CFLs are no longer certified. EPA does keep a legacy list of old certified products, but the current certification list on the EPA website won't show those products that are not certified to the current version 2.0. Other changes of the Energy Star lamps update really affect uh, filament lamps. These filament LED lamps, which are fairly new to the industry, following the trends that had been set by popular incandescent vintage-style filament lamps, now you have LED versions of these that can now be certified to Energy Star. They also included warmer CCTs such as 2200K because some of these are being introduced in a warmer yellowish color down to 2200K. Those are now able to be certified for these filament lamps. Just a point of note, these filament lamps are required to go through a full 6,000 hours of testing. That's eight and a half months. It's because this is a fairly new technology, and EPA was concerned that these would go through a full gamut of testing before these can come out. The regular products with the traditional LEDs can be certified early after a 3,000-hour life test. Okay, moving on to the Energy Star Luminaires program. It is also in version 2.0 currently. It was released in May of 2015 and became effective June of last year. Fixtures that were certified to the previous version have probably already been recertified, but they had to be recertified by June of last year. The big change with this update is that now luminaires can be certified using an E26 socket. That's a major change to the program because previously 
you could only have a GU24 base socket, and most of these fixtures to be Energy Star certified. So now you can use any Energy Star certified lamp. I talked about the lamps programs in a previous slide. So any of those lamps that are certified can be included in the fixture. They still have to be included in the fixture, but they, they, but they can be included in the fixture packaging, and you can get that product certified even if it's the E26. You still can use GU24, but E26 is now allowed. So just summarizing the updates to the Energy Star Lamps and Luminaires program and how this affects really the lum products that used to maybe carry a couple of CFL GU24 lamps in the box. Now they're going to probably have LEDs in the box, and they can be E26 based. Another way a luminaire like this one pictured can be certified is also with the integral LED light engine. And I'll talk a little bit more about those later. But integral engines are also another way you can certify products with the Energy Star Luminaires program. With regards to the Luminaires updates, another part of it is called the Certified Subcomponent Database. The Certified Subcomponent Database allows you to certify components such as LED light engines and other components that may not have traditional ANSI bases. So what I'm showing here are a couple of lamps that don't fit the traditional A-style PAR BR shapes. And so a product of this shape is not allowed to be Energy Star certified to lamps. Energy Star lamps only allows you to get a product that has a standard ANSI shape. So these non-traditional shapes are not allowed to be part of the Energy Star Lamps program. However, if you want to use those in a fixture, you can have these on the certified subcomponent database, which means on, on that CSD, it means that product meets all the requirements to get that fixture Energy Star certified or that luminaire Energy Star, Energy Star certified. And so non-traditional shapes that have GU24 bases are allowed now to be on the CSD. It is only for GU24 bases currently, but these products can be on the CSD and can be used to help you certify luminaires. Okay, so that's a real quick for the Energy Star. Now let's go on to Title 24. So Title 24 is the California's Building Energy Efficiency Standards. It's required for any building that requires a permit in the state of California. Lighting installations and new construction and also alterations must meet applicable Title 24 requirements in order to receive a permit. This is verified by building inspectors. Title 24, by the way, is updated every three years by the California Energy Commission, the CEC. The current applicable version that we're under right now is Title 24, 2016. 2019 is actually already under development for the next three-year cycle. Before that, we were on California Title 24, 2013. So the one that's in effect right now is Title 24, 2016. So on June 10th of 2015, the CEC voted to approve very significant changes in Title 24, 2016 that became effective this year. So before I go into more about what Title 24 is, let me really quickly explain what it is not, because I get a lot of these questions, and I'm sure some of you do as well. It is not a product certification. It is a building code. It's applicable to buildings in the state. So I get people say a lot of times, show me your list of Title 24 compliant products. Well, that really doesn't make any sense, because you can't have a building compliant product. You can have products that can be used to help to you get that building Title 24 compliant, but since it is a building code, you can only use products to meet the building code. You can use various kinds of products to meet the code. So you'll see logos such as this one used by MaxLight. We have products that support Title 24 compliance, but there's no such thing as Title 24 compliant product. Also, it is not Title 20. Title 20, I'm going to talk about, but Title 20 is an appliance regulation, and some lighting is considered appliances in California. That is required for any product sold in the state. Title 24 does not regulate products sold in the state. Title 24 is a building code. So if you recognize that Title 24 is a building code and not a product code, you're already ahead of the game. So just make sure that you understand that. Okay, so what updates happen for this latest cycle? The biggest thing is that all lighting installed in residential construction must be 100% high efficacy. That's a major change from the previous versions of the program. Prior to this, you could have a certain amount of low efficacy or incandescent in uh, certain rooms in the home, in like, like the kitchen. You could do 50% in some cases. In various other rooms, you could have a certain amount of low efficacy products. Well, that's no longer the case. Everything has to be high efficacy. Building inspectors are going to be looking for 100% high efficacy in all new construction. The definition of high efficacy at the same time has also been significantly expanded and changed. I'm going to talk about what that means. Another big change is the luminaires no longer need to include GU24 sockets. So similar to the Energy Star Luminaires program I just talked about, luminaires in the state of California were also, prior to this latest change, required to have GU24 sockets. And this was put into the program to make sure that the consumers never went back to a low efficacy source, the same reason they put it into the Energy Star program. But both programs have realized that with the changes that the DOE has implemented for a lot of incandescent sources, and also with the ubiquitous nature of LED lamps and the pricing coming down and everything, 
is not of a big concern that consumers are going to go back to an incandescent source. And so now they've allowed these E26 bases to be included in these products. Now, if you put an E26 base lamp into a California Tile 24 fixture now, it has to be what's called JA8 compliant. I'm going to talk about that quite a bit in a second. All the luminaires must include a compliance source. So every luminaire in the state of California that already has to be high, high efficacy for this new code, it has to include not only that, but a compliance source. It has to include a compliance source at the time of inspection. So every fixture has to have a light source in it when the inspector comes through. Now, the lamps do not have to be included in the packaging like the Energy Star program, but it has to be in the fixture at the time of inspection. So any luminaire in the state of California has to have a compliance source at the time of inspection. Not only that, those sources must be registered with the state and labeled as JA8 compliant, or it has to say either JA8-2016 or JA8-2016-E, which indicates it's elevated temperature or enclosed rated. Now, certain products do have to have sources that are labeled dash E, and one of those is a downlight. So every downlight has to have a product that's labeled JA8-2016-E. That means it's been elevated temperature tested and is it suitable for those kinds of environments. Downlights can also not include screw base sockets. So all the downlights, they cannot include any screw base sockets. As uh, per the previous requirement, they still also have to be ICAT rated. That's uh, an insulation contact and airtight rated. That's no change. And then the builders must also provide the homeowner with a luminaire schedule. And this luminaire schedule not only has to show the luminaires, of course, it also has to show every single light source that's installed in a luminaire. So there was some concern that the builders would go around and take packages of light sources and move those from home to home. Well, this is to prevent some of that, just to make sure that the homeowner has a list of every single compliance sources installed in those luminaires. All right, so I talk about the changes that are happening here, mainly affecting residential, but I want you to be aware that the residential changes I'm talking about are not only just applicable to residential single-family type buildings. They're also applicable to a number of other spaces. Just real quick, Title 24 covers all buildings in the state of California. So there is another section of it, the commercial section, which is called the non-residential section of the standards. And that was largely untouched in this latest cycle. Title 24, 2016 primarily went after the residential part really hard because in the previous version, it, they really went after the non-res pretty hard. Just for your information, the non-residential part of the standards really addressed the building envelope. They talk about controls and every fixture has to be controlled. And it's really about the lighting density and trying to control the space to get your efficiency. With regards to residential, it's really about a prescriptive approach per luminaire, as I've already talked about. But these residential requirements also apply not only to single family, they also apply to high-rise multifamily, hotel and motel guest rooms for your hospitality. It applies to fire station dwellings, dormitories, senior housing, all these types of spaces that are similar to a typical residential dwelling environment. So residential lighting requirements that I'm talking about, which are these major changes, they are effective for a number of other types of spaces shown here. All right, what, what types of installations are affected by these changes? Typically, uh, Title 24 addresses your hardwired luminaires. It's only for permanently installed luminaires. It's not applicable to portable luminaires. However, some portable luminaires, as deemed by the state, could fall into the permanently installed luminaires definition. So permanently installed luminaires that are attached to walls, ceilings, or columns, that are inside of permanently installed cabinets, they're integral to fans or ceiling fans, those are all considered permanently installed luminaires. So even if that luminaire is a typical portable luminaire by definition as a cord and plug, if it's attached, it actually falls into the definition of a permanently installed luminaire. So the, the question comes up quite often about hospitality dwellings and wall sconces that are attached, they have a cord and plug. If it's attached, it falls into the permanently installed definition and has to meet all these requirements. All right, so this is a very important slide here. This is Table 150.0. This really defines for the state of California in Title 24, 2016, what is high efficacy and what is not. So this table actually shows you very clearly what is high efficacy. So on the uh, left side of this table, everything shown on the left side, 1 through 7, these are products that are automatically deemed high efficacy by the state. So no other requirements have to be met. You don't have to have J8 compliance. You don't have to do any of that if it's on the left side of this table. So what is that? Number one is pin-based linear fluorescent or CFL light sources that have electronic ballast. Those are automatically high efficacy. The inspectors are trained to, if they see this type of a product, to move on, and it's already considered a high efficacy product. Other products that are automatically high efficacy, pole star metal halide, high-pressure sodium, 
GU24 sockets that contain light sources other than LED. So a GU24 socket with a CFL, uh, that's GU24. I bolded this because this is how most of the Title 24 was addressed prior to this change. You still can do that if you have a CFL GU24. That's automatically high efficacy. No other requirements need to be met. Also, if it's a hardwired high-frequency generator induction lamp, so it's induction, it's automatically high efficacy. If it's an inseparable solid-state luminaire that's installed outdoors, so if it's a solid-state luminaire that's installed outdoors, it's automatically high efficacy. Now, it's in, it has to be inseparable. It has to be a product that contains an LED light engine. That's, what they, that's how they call an inseparable product in the state of California. If it contains a socket, it, uh, it has to fall into the right category. But in, if it's inseparable SSL luminaires installed outdoors, automatically high efficacy. It doesn't need to meet anything else. Also, inseparable solid-state luminaries that contain colored light sources that are installed provide decorative lighting, like monochromatic blues or reds or something that's, that's decorative. That's fine. That's automatically high efficacy. Other than that, everything else has to contain a compliant light source within the socket or, with the, or within the fixture. So if it's not one of these seven, it has to have a certified or JAA compliant light source within the product. And so to reiterate, it shows you number eight, it's all down lights have to have a certified source. A GU24 sockets that contain LED has to be a certified source. And anything else that's not listed. So if it's anything else, if it's a E12 candelabra base, anything that's not shown on the left side, they all have to be a compliant light source within the product. Now the question comes up here a lot, what about products such as tube lamp, a TA tube that's LED. Well, that's not shown here. So a TA tube lamp would, yes, have to be J8 compliant, and it would need to meet all the necessary requirements. Those are easy to find. I don't know of any that exist on the market today. So right now, if you have a linear fixture, you have to have a pin-based linear fluorescent or an integral source of J8 compliant. I don't know of any LED tube lamps that are out just yet. All right, so what is this compliant? I've been talking about this J8. What does it mean? Well, the Title 24 2016 standards is a document that's almost 300 pages long. It's a very intensive document that talks about all the requirements you have to have for plumbing, a number of the things in the construction, and it includes lighting. There's a lot of details that are left out of there, and those are in the reference appendices. The reference appendices document is an even longer document of about 500 plus pages. It contains one section for residential appendices and one section for non-residential appendices. The residential appendices have RA numbers, RA1 through the last one, and then non-residential section of the appendices, they have NA numbers, and then they're applicable to both is the joint appendices, so JA. And the number eight section just happens to apply to all the lighting requirements that I'm talking about. So that's where that comes from. So the Joint Appendix 8, or JA8, that is the section of the reference appendices that contains all of these standards. It's kind of like their version of Energy Star and gives all the, the applicable requirements for standards that I'm talking about. Okay, so what are the JA8 requirements? So this is not the complete list of requirements. It's longer than this, but these are some of the major ones that I'll go through really quickly. So summary of the requirements, looking at the efficacy. The efficacy has to be at least 45 lumens per watt. You may not think that's very high, and it's not. And most, most LED products today are hovering around 70 to 100 plus lumens per watt. CFLs are right around 65. What this does is effectively take out incandescent, most incandescents 10 to 20 lumens per watt. Power factor has to be at least a 0 0.9. Well, that is actually fairly stringent. Most products that are energy star, by the way, are about 0.7. You can actually go down to 0 0.6 for some of the lamps. So 0 0.9 is actually a relatively high power factor. So that's a very stringent requirement, something that's not implemented into any other program that I know of right now. The color rendering index has to be at least 90. So that's actually a very stringent requirement for residential. It's actually unheard of for residential products to typically have a color rendering for 90 CRI as part of a program for the first one to implement something like this. It was a bit controversial when they implemented this, but they were really trying to address the consumer having a good quality product. And so they were, the Energy Commission was very adamant that they have a high color rendering in all these products. But not only does it have to be 90 CRI color rendering, it has to also have an R9 value greater than or equal to 50. Now, what that means is that that is your red content. Your red levels have to be a certain point. It is uh, possible to have a high CRI and have some of the other color parts of that CRI metric in the higher numbers than just your, your overall CRI. The commission was very concerned about this and wanted to make sure that specifically the red content was addressed. And so you have to have not only 90 CRI, but R9 value greater than 50. CCT has to be a maximum of 4,000K for integral products with engines, inseparable luminaires with engines. For lamps, they can only be up to 3,000K. Now, the flicker, 
I've bolded this section because this is one of the, the more interesting requirements as part of Title 24, 2016. There are no national standards for Flickr. A number of groups have started processes to come up with some, the ANSI, IES, and other, other groups. But there is no national standard that exists uh, right now for Flickr, and so California essentially created one for this code requirement. And so you have to have a less than 30% Flickr rate, but it has to be per the test that they developed, which is actually spelled out in another part of the appendices called called JA-10. And so the test that was developed for in the state of California, largely by the California Lightning Technology Commission and, and the CEC, requires you have a less than 30% flicker rate for frequencies less than 200 hertz at maximum output and also 20% of your light output. So you not only have to have this less than 30% flicker rate, it has to be there at maximum and 20% of the output. So that leads you to the next point here. All of these products have to be dimmable. Not only dimmable, but dimmable down to 10%. So every compliance source in the state of California has to be dimmable to at least 10% of the maximum light output. Testing products have to be elevated temperature testing, all omni lamps greater than equal to 10 watts, that are not labeled for use in enclosed fixtures, that are not labeled not for use in enclosed fixtures or not for use in recessed fixtures. And so the products that are intended to be used in enclosed fixtures or recess, they all have to be tested for elevated temperatures. Labeling, I mentioned before, they all have to have these labels on the actual engine or the actual light source, the lamp or the engine has to be labeled J8-2016 or J8-2016-E. There are some exceptions for tiny lamps such as GG9s and lamps that are less than 2 inches in diameter because we just physically don't have the room for them, but those still have to be registered on the database. They have some exceptions on the labeling. A little bit more about that flicker testing requirement I talked about. It is spelled out in JA10 of that same reference appendices. I talked about the requirements already, but this actually shows you what the actual test is that was developed by the state. I can tell you there's not a ton of labs that know how to run this test because it's a fairly new test. There are a few in China, and a few, many labs in the United States now are starting to come up to speed with it. But if you need any help trying to identify a lab, if you have products, just let me know. I can direct you to a lab. Okay, so... This is especially important for anybody selling luminaires in the state of California to know that you have to make sure when you're selling a fixture that intends to be used for new or, or remodel residential construction that's going to need a permit in the state that there are lamps that are available for the sockets. If you don't, you could be selling a product that ends up on a job site that cannot possibly be used to comply with code because there are no lamps that exist to go into those installations. And so I just put this up here as a reminder for those that are selling products for new construction in the state that you make sure that there is a light source for that socket. So if you're looking at the G9, I have on the far left of this slide, there's no G9 lamps that I know of on the market. Actually, I've heard of one or two that are coming, but I haven't seen any just yet. The GU10, MR16s, these products are becoming wider and wider available. I'm going to show you what's available here in a second, but you have to make sure that, that there are J8 compliant versions of these lamps for your installation so you don't end up with a situation where you can't get a permit for property and you, you don't have a source because you don't have a source for it. So what is available right now? You can go to this website that I'm showing here, the URL on the, on the CaliforniaEnergy.ca.gov webpage, and you can see, because every one of these products have to be registered, you can see what products are available today. I just did a search again today, and as of today, there are 3,454 compliant luminaires and light sources on that list. This is changing very rapidly. The last check I did was in March, and it was at around 2,000 plus. So it is increasing very quickly. Right now, you have 61 manufacturing companies with 91 brands of products there. I can tell you most of these are inseparable luminaires. So most of these are down lights and close-to-ceiling fixtures and, and fixtures of a similar type that have engines in them. So most of these are inseparable luminaires. As far as lamps, there's not a ton of products right now. You have 54 Omni lamps, 160 directional models. A lot of those actually. The uh, light engines, there are a few, but there's six, only six decorative lamps today. So this is, this is what you have on the list. You can go to the list on your own time and see what's, what's there, but every product that is J8 compliant has to be registered on this database. Now, this will be the only slide I show as far as a commercial for MaxLight. This may be the one slide that some of you wanted to see during the course of this presentation. I've updated it today, and this is what we have as of right now. And so I'm going to show you here what we have in stock and what we have coming up. So currently we have three products that are in stock. We have two 60-watt equivalent products, one's an enclosed rated and one's a non-enclosed rated product. Uh, the difference is a slight higher price for the enclosed rated version. It has a little bit more electronics in it. I don't know moving forward if we'll continue to have both products because uh, we're finding that price difference between enclosed and non-enclosed is, is shrinking as far as the cost of the components. 
And so uh, we may in the future just launch an enclosed product, but this is what we have today because we came out with these in the very inception of our J8 offering. We also have a 100-watt equivalent that's in stock today. All three of these products are available in 2700 and 3000K. The 100-watt equivalent is a 17-watt A21 product. All of these products are not only JA8 compliant, they're also Energy Star compliant. The JA8 requirements are a little more extensive than Energy Star, and so what we're, and they use similar tests. So pretty much every product that we will offer will likely have both. So these are what we have today. As far as what we just went into production on just very recently, we went into production on a B10 40 watt equivalent filament lamp and also a A19 E26 filament lamp. So both of these products are in production today, and what that means is for those of you who source products from us in China, you can get them pretty much immediately. For those of you who source products from us in the United States, we'll have these in our warehouses in about 45 days. So this is what we're doing right now as far as in stock and production. Coming up very soon, the next two items we'll be launching actually will be the MR16 and the GU10. Those will actually be right behind the filaments. So it may be a little bit before the summer. We've been requested recently for a GU24 Omni. Now, we did not have this on our original plan. We wanted to stick with E26, but feedback I've gotten from a lot of you is that you want a GU24 Omni, and so we're developing that right now. In addition, we're going to have a GU25 E26, and later on in the year we'll have a couple of puck lamp versions. And so this is our current plan. It's uh, fluid and changing, and so we'll be adjusting this as the market demands. All right, so a little bit more about the impact on luminaires for Title 24. Because of the product availability issues I alluded to earlier, some manufacturers are deciding to put the compliant lamps in the box with the luminaires. That eases the situation for everybody as far as trying to find a product to go into that luminaire. Also, some manufacturers, as far as the inseparable fixtures, are making separate SKUs just for just for the state of California and, the, and that market. Retailers that have products on the shelf that may end up in the hands of some customers that want to use that for permitted construction may need to educate their customers because it's not very likely you're going to have a lot of code-compliant products sitting on the shelf for your consumers to use. They may not know that they need to source those kinds of products. And so if you're going to sell a product to a customer that intends to use that for some construction that may need to get a, a permit for it, you may need to help them get another product. One note about outdoor residential luminaire impact. All outdoor lighting also must be high efficacy. That's just every, every light in the home has to be high efficacy, including outdoor. If the outdoor lighting, again, is an inseparable luminaire, it's automatically high efficacy. If it has a socket, it has to have JA compliant sources in there. But remember, all outdoor lighting for residential still has to be controlled. So you still have to have either one of these controls, photo cell motion sensor, time switch, or time clock. Now, I put this on here to remind you because I talked about how the GU24 CFLs are automatically high efficacy. And so I put this here to show you that if you want to use a GU24 CFL, you have to be very careful if you're going to use it in an outdoor product because you still have to have some kind of control. And a lot of times for residential, it's done with motion sensors. Every CFL box will tell you don't use it with controls. So if you switch a CFL quite a bit, it will die very quickly. And so just a word of caution about using CFLs with some of these products that are controlled by motion sensors. Lighting that is not attached to the building is not regulated. So landscape, you can do whatever you want to. It's not regulated by any of these codes. A little more about the impact on luminaires, luminaires that include engines, these inseparable luminaires are what they call them in the state. They have to be registered, and they have to have engines that meet the code. And so the full fixture has to be certified on that database, and that fixture has to be compliant, has to have an engine that's compliant. It has to have a 4,000K max CCT engine in it. It's just a note, if that engine happens to be removable, and removable, it really means if it's, if it's easily moved between fixture to fixture, if it's not removing wires, cutting wires, screws, if it's easily removable, it's treated in the state exactly like a lamp. And so it has to meet all the same requirements as a lamp. It has to go through 6,000 hours. That's eight and a half months of testing. It has to have all that same testing. If you integrate that into the product, if it's inseparable, then you can use the LMA data of the chip. And so that's a lot quicker time to market for you. So just keep that in mind. Now, the impact on lamps for people such as MaxLight, we have to create entirely new SKUs for Title 24. We have to label them. As you see here, we're trying to make this bigger. On the, some of the, the initial lamps that we offered with the text was a little small, so we're trying to make that bigger now uh, to make that more visible to the inspector so they can see it. But this has to be on every compliant lamp. You have to have this JA8 marking. 
we have to use sometimes more expensive and not as widely available chips. I mentioned the LEDs have to be at least 90 CRI, but 90 CRI plus R9 greater than 50. So that's not a standardly widely available chip, and so we have to use different chips than we use in the rest of our products. Most of the other rest of the country, they're perfectly fine with 80 CRI LED chips. So this is a different product that we have to use in these particular light sources. The lamps must be tested for 6,000 hours. This is a full 6,000-hour test. That's eight and a half months. So that's why you don't see these products coming out very, very quickly because it takes quite a bit to do the lifetime testing. That is probably the gating factor in a lot of cases. Products such as this G9 lamp, I mentioned there's no products I know of on the market right now. We don't have one just yet. We've tried. The problem is the lamp is so small that it's tough to design it with the electronics that you need to get to the flicker metric. In order for the product to meet the flicker requirements and the dimmability requirements, it's going to a lot of times take some extra circuitry in the products, maybe some capacitors, maybe some other things. But when you have a, a tiny lamp such as this one, which is just over an inch wide, it's really tough to get the electronics in something that's that small and also still try to get your maximum light output out of it. So it may be impossible to get one of these products. It may be possible at some point, but at this point, MaxLight, at least, does not have a G9 lamp and some of these smaller lamps. So it's just going to be difficult on some of these miniature lamps to get to the metrics required to meet J8 compliance. Okay, so that's Title 24. Now let's talk about Title 20. Title 20 is the appliance efficiency regulations. This is important because any manufacturer of the regulated appliances must have their product certified to the commission before you can even sell it in the state of California. If you do not, then that product can be fined up to $2,500 per individual item sold. Title 20 is basically the law of the state, and so if you have a non-compliant product being sold in the state, it is subject to fines. Title 20 has no set schedule like Title 24 for updates. It's updated whenever the commission sees fit. And so what happened with this is on January 27th of 2016, CEC voted to approve a major change to a mini lighting product sold in the state that's going to become effective January 1 of 2018. So what appliances are covered under Title 20? This is not the uh, the full list. This is pretty much most of the products. So it, of course, covers appliances, but it, some lighting products are considered appliances under this appliance regulation. That includes fluorescent lamp ballasts. It includes some types of lamps, and it includes certain types of luminaires. Again, all the state-regulated products are required to be certified and registered in the CEC database. So what types of lighting products or luminaires are regulated under Title 20? Right now, it's a metal halide luminaires. There are certain minimum efficacy numbers required there. Certain under luminaires is only T8 fluorescence attached to office furniture. And then portable luminaires. So the portable luminaire requirements, these have existed since 2010, so these have been in place for a number of years. The way you can comply with the state regulations, this is for all portable luminaires, you can have a dedicated fluorescent lamp socket with electronic ballast. You can have a GU24 socket. Make sure it's just not rated for use with incandescent. It can be an LED luminaire or portable luminaire with an engine, so basically a separable type of a portable luminaire, as long as the engine meets all of these requirements, 200 lumens minimum, 40 lumens for wide efficacy, et cetera. You can also have it equipped with a screw base socket and pre-package it with a CFL or LED lamp. This is how most portable luminaire makers comply with the code right now. They call it the bulb and box approach. And so that CFL has to be compatible with any controls you have on that portable luminaire. CFL just has to be at least 50 lumens for wide access to an old Energy Star efficacy requirement. I bold here, though, the lamps, if it has an LED lamp in the box, you must meet the minimum requirements of current Title 20, and that's what's about to change. The other way, by the way, you can, you can comply is with the, if you have a halogen fixture, as long as you have a dedicated single-ended socket, doesn't, it's just not more than 100 watts. There are some exceptions for portable luminaires, ones that are for artwork, like the 24-inch articulated arm luminaires and portable wall mount adjustables with the 24-inch articulated arm. And also, portable luminaires with internal power supplies must have zero standby when the luminaire is off. But getting back to this LED lamp requirement that's about to change, and so what's really changing for 2018? So state-regulated LED lamps that include any of these bases shown, so any lamp that's LED that includes an E12, that that's a candle base, a E17, that's intermediate base, a E26, that's your standard screw base, and a GU24, and it also is applicable to retrofit kits that have those same bases, retrofit kits for downlights that have those same bases. Any of those bases are now going to be state-regulated in 2018 that are LED lamps. 
Um, does not include lamps that are over 2,600 lumens. Those are considered more commercial type of output lamps. And it doesn't include anything with a CCT less than 2,207,000 K. Those are considered way on the yellow end of the spectrum and, and much more on the cool side of the spectrum. But anything else, it's, all, it's included now in state regulations. The other types of lamps that are going to be affected by this 2018 change are small diameter directional lamps. I notice this doesn't say LED. This is for all small diameter directional lamps. So that includes uh, all your MR16s and MR11s. So all those MR16 halogen lamps that are being used in the state right now, those are going to have to meet these new requirements starting in 2018. So this is very new. There's no federal requirements for these lamps right now. So these lamps have not been previously required to meet federal requirements or any other state requirements. So this is the first state that I know of that's implementing a state requirement for these types of lamps. All right, so let's look specifically at the state-regulated LED lamps. Starting in 2018, it has to have at least CRI greater than or equal to 82. But not only that, it has to have R1 through R8 values greater than or equal to 72. Now you see those R numbers again. Now this is everything other than reds, but this, this is telling you that all of those other color metrics that are part of the overall color rendering index have to have a certain value as well. And that has to be greater than or equal to 72. This is going to essentially make a lot of the manufacturers use 90 CRI chips. There's not a lot of 82 CRI chips out there, a lot of them are 80 or 90, and you can do some mixing to get to some of these metrics. But unless some other chip makers come around and start making chips just for the California market, we'll probably be using 90 CRI chips in a lot of cases to meet these metrics. The power factor here has to be at least 0 0.7. Their rated life has to be at least 10,000 hours. And then they've implemented a compliance score that you also have to meet. And it, it kicks in in two tiers. Actually, one is, is starting in 2018, and it gets even higher in 2019. This compliance score is essentially your efficacy plus 2.3 times your CRI. The state of California recognizes that you in, decrease your luminous efficacy as you increase your color rendering index. It's just a matter of physics. And so they give you a way to either lower or raise both of those numbers, efficacy or CRI, and get to this minimum compliance score. And I show an example here of a couple of ways you could do it. So starting in 2018, all the state-regulated LED lamps, and it includes the scope of products that I showed in the previous slide, have to be registered with the state and have to meet all these regulations. All right, the state-regulated small diameter directional lamps starting in 2018 must meet these requirements. They have to be at least 25,000 hours uh, rated life, that's going to eliminate, of course, a lot of incandescent products. It has to be 80 lumens per watt, and it also eliminates a lot of other products. Or it can have a minimum efficacy and a compliance score greater than or equal to 165. Now, the compliance score in this case is a little bit different. It's a lot simpler. It's just efficacy plus your CRI. So these are the requirements for all small diameter directional lamps. That includes MR11, MR16, GU10, R, PAR16, anything two inches or less. That is all included in these state-regulated small diameter directional lamps. So it's going to eliminate most incandescent and halogen MR11, MR16, GU10, R, PAR16s, and require a move towards LED. So just kind of summarizing a, a portable luminaire maker and how you would comply with some of these new codes starting in 2018. So if you have a portable luminaire uh, with the E26CFL, everything stays the same. And in 2018, pretty much everything has to meet the same requirements. If you have an LED in the box, then starting in 2018, that LED lamp must be a state-registered LED lamp with the state and meeting all Title 20 requirements. Title 20 also, by the way, includes some marking guidelines. It's not the same as the marking on the individual lamps that we have for the J8 compliance, but it has to show date of manufacture and effective dates. So the effective dates as far as meeting the January 1, 2018, goes by the manufacturing code on the product. And so after that manufacturing code date, it has to be registered with the state and meet any applicable codes. This is a question that comes up. What about JA8 compliant lamps versus Title 20 in 2018? Do they automatically meet? Well, as far as the requirements, the JA8 requirements are a lot more stringent than the Title 20 requirements. And so, yes, it should actually meet all the requirements. However, they have a little bit different approval mechanisms. There's a, there's a separate database that exists on that CEC website I showed you where it shows all the, the, the uh, compliant products. There's a section that says state-regulated LED lamps. And there's another section that says 2016 J8 compliant products. And so these products have to be registered in both individual sections. They are 
both California Energy Commission programs, but they are administered by two different groups. One group is the buildings group, and one group, one group is the appliance group. And so they they don't always have the exact same requirements, but essentially, if a product is J8 compliant, it should meet Title 20. As a manufacturer of those products, we just have to get it registered in two different places. For more information on either of these programs for Energy Star, you can go to the energystar.gov website. There's a section for lamps and a section for luminaires. For more information on Title 24, here are the websites where you can get some information on those particular programs. And with that, that's pretty much all I have. I appreciate your time and attendance. I'll open the phone lines up now for questions, or you can ask on the chat portal. If you do not have any questions and just want to contact me later, my contact information is C Primus, C P R I M O U S at maxlight.com, M A X L I T E. So that's C P R I M O U S at maxlight.com, or you can contact me at 862 485 9878. Again, 862 485 9878. And so uh, we'll open up the chat line and some of these I'm going to answer offline. They're coming through in the chat portal because it's just a little more involved, but I'm going to call out a couple of these. So one, one I see here is there a fee for registering luminaries with the CEC database. The commission charges no fee. However, the lab that you work with may charge a fee to do that work for you. And so a lot of times the lab will do that work. You can, as a manufacturer, submit the information yourself using the lab data. So if you decide to go the lab route, the lab may charge you, but there's no fee from the state of California for registering their products. The question came from James, what's the difference between a separable and inseparable luminaire? There is definitely a definition section within the Title 24 code that talks about this a bit, but I, uh, essentially, as I understand it, and again, you would have to go to the Energy Commission for the final say on this, but my interpretation is that the sep- inseparable versus, versus separable is that if, it's, if it has screws and requires the cutting of wires and it doesn't require that luminaire in order to operate, uh, like let's say, for instance, you have a heat sink built into the luminaire, then if it, if it requires all that, it, it, it's inseparable. If you can take that out easily by just you know move, removing a quick connect or something like that, and it's essentially acting like a lamp, and you can easily transfer it between products, and they consider that a non-inseparable or separable type product, and that's how I essentially have viewed it. And the material here is going to be posted to our website. The question was about when will this be available. Uh, we, we will post this webinar to the website. As far as getting a PDF copy, I think we can make that available as well. I'll stay on for a couple more questions if anybody has anything. Yeah, the question was about T8 LEDs. I, uh, so T8 LEDs are not on that automatic high efficacy list. I assume this is about Title 24. So for Title 24, if you have a T8 tube LED, if it's not, it would definitely have to be JA8 compliant. So, yes, you would have to have a code-compliant lamp if you're going to try to use a T8 LED into a fixture in California. And as I mentioned, I don't think those really exist right now that I know of. Question about Title 20. Would JA8 source uh, be registered for Title 20? Uh, They have to be registered again for Title 20, but the JA8 source meets all the requirements for Title 20, so it should be fine if you want to use that same product for Title 20. There is one small nuance that a lot of people may not know, uh, that the California Title 20 requires a California-approved laboratory to do the test. Title 24 has no such requirement, so as long as the manufacturer of that product and MaxLight actually, all, all the products that we have that are Title 24 compliant have been through a CEC approved lab, so all those products will meet the Title 24, and so we'll just have to get them registered on a separate database, but yes, any JA compliant product should be uh, Title 20 compliant as well. Okay, I appreciate everybody's time. I just sent my contact information to you guys also in the chat window again. If you need to get in touch with me, there's my information or contact your MaxLight rep. I appreciate the time again. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day.